All right, everyone. Well, I'll keep the, today's introduction short, but I'm uh, pleased once again to introduce Professor Mike Rosen on the second of uh, the Steenbach lectures today. And uh, yesterday we heard a really exciting story about you know the fundamentals of biological condensates and the types of changes to uh, chemistry and, and reactivity that can occur inside these structures. And today, uh, Professor Rosen is going to be telling us about uh, some of the biological implications of these structures uh, in the context of chromatin uh, in the cell. So without further ado, I'll just pass it off. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, it, it really has been just a spectacular couple of days uh, for me here, just hearing so much wonderful, wonderful science. Um, from the faculty, frankly, especially from the students that I had lunch with today. Everybody had great stories. Um, just been really, really stimulating for me, and they have some collaborations to go home with, so just great all around. Um, and, and I'll reiterate what I said yesterday, uh, what an honor it is for me to be giving the Steenbach lectures, um, both because Steenbach is really you know, one of the pioneers um, in nutrition science, which then led to biochemistry, which is sort of my intellectual home, and also because of his, his strong commitment to the benefit of passing uh, basic science onto the public good um, through commercialization, which again is something that I also feel, feel quite strongly about. So um, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. So the work I'm going to tell you about today um, <coughs> is, is very, very new area in my lab. Um, we've always focused throughout my entire career on protein molecules. Um, nucleic acids kind of scared me. Um, we've always focused on biology that occurs in the cytoplasm and really never ventured into the nucleus. Um, but, but as I'll explain to you, our, our understanding of the kind of molecular species that could undergo liquid-liquid phase separation uh, recently has taken us into a new compartment, the nucleus, and a new kind of biomolecule, chromatin. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is just spend just a few minutes reiterating some of the sort of points that I made at the very beginning yesterday and then tell you um, about our new work in this area of, of chromatin organization. So um, <clears throat> again, research in my lab has focused for about the last uh, dozen years or so on these uh, cellular compartments that we've taken to calling biomolecular condensates. Um, condensates, by definition, are compartments in cells that concentrate selected groups of molecules, both protein molecules, RNA molecules, probably small molecules. And the key thing is that they concentrate them in discrete foci in the absence of a surrounding membrane. Uh, condensates occur both on uh, membranes, uh, said a lot yesterday about actin assembly um, being controlled by, by membrane-bound condensates. But then many, many of uh, condensates are found uh, either in the cytoplasm or in the nucleoplasm. Um, key feature of condensates is that the components are, are quite dynamic. Uh, they move around within the compartment. They exchange between the compartment and surroundings quite rapidly. Yet even in the face of that dynamics, Condensate remain, condensates remain distinct from one another with distinct collections of, of components. Um, condensates are involved in a uh, diverse range of biological processes. It kind of feels like every time we open up a journal lately, there's a new condensate that's involved in some new biological process. Um, and similarly, they are involved in an increasing number of diseases, um, spanning from neurodegeneration out to skin disorders and various cancers. I'm sure there will be more, more to come. And a key point from my uh, uh, lecture yesterday is that many condensates, but again, not certainly not all, but many of them, appear to form through this physical process of liquid-liquid phase separation driven by multivalent macromolecules. Now, <clears throat> um, over the last decade, there have been a very wide range of, of molecular types that have been um, shown to, to uh, interact through weak multivalent interactions and, and uh, consequently phase separate. Everything from multi-domain proteins that we've worked on a lot in my lab. Um, uh, other people, uh, Minji Zhang in Hong Kong has done a lot of work on the postsynaptic density. Its components are multivalent and phase separate. Been a lot of work on intrinsically disordered regions of macromolecules that can also 
interact with each other through multiple adhesive elements connected by flexible tethers. Um, <clears throat> RNA and DNA through repetitive base pairing interactions can also assemble and phase separate. And an example that I, that I always like to give and becomes directly relevant today is all of the, the ideas that underlie this basically come from polymer chemistry. And a key point in polymer chemistry is the notion of multivalency driving assembly and phase separation is independent of the scale of the system you're talking about. And so um, a nice example of that is synaptic vesicles, where the vesicle is much, much, much larger, an order of magnitude larger than any of these molecules. But nevertheless, if one generates vesicles coated with um, adhesive molecules, they will assemble sharply to form a, a phase separated liquid whose, whose unit component is something even as large as a vesicle. Okay? And again, that will become relevant in just a moment in the context of chromatin. And importantly, again, this comes straight out of polymer chemistry, this notion of multivalency producing these structures leads very naturally to modes of regulation because polymer chemistry tells us that higher valence, the, the larger the number of adhesive elements in a given molecule, as well as higher affinity between the adhesive elements, um, uh, promote oligomerization and thus promote phase separation. And I spent a lot of time yesterday talking about a system uh, here on the left that regulates actin assembly, um, where changes in phosphotyrosine is effectively changes in valence and drives phase separation. Um, and there are a lot of other examples um, uh, in the literature as well um, for disordered proteins being regulated this way. So with that as a very, very brief prelude, um, this has taken us into um, a completely new area um, for my lab. And I'll, I'll sort of introduce the problem and then I'll tell you how we got into it through this, through this lens. Um, and the problem is the organization of chromatin um, in the eukaryotic nucleus. And the basic problem uh, coming from the world of structural biology to me is just cool. And that is that you know, every cell in the human body has about two meters of, of DNA in it. And that has to be compacted into the nucleus, which is on the order of 10 microns in diameter, which is a tremendous degree of compaction. And one thing I've done to try to sort of appreciate this is to, to move it to kind of a human scale. And that is, if you took all of the DNA in a human body, my body, and you lined it up end to end, how big would it be? And the answer is that would go from Earth to Pluto and back three times. But yet it's compacted into me, right, and all of you, right? So it's just this incredible amount of compaction of this polymer chain of double-stranded DNA. Um, but this must occur with a lot of restrictions. So it has to retain dynamics in order to permit regulation and function. Um, moreover, it has to occur non-isotropically. There have to be distinct functional domains that are on scales of, let's say, kilobases to megabases. And of course, this organization is known to control a, a huge range of nuclear processes, everything from transcription to replication to repair. Um, it goes awry in a, in a very large number of diseases, most notably many cancers. Um, so it's a, a very important problem for basic biology and human disease. Now, if you look in canonical explanations of this that have appeared in textbooks, the organization of chromatin, the compaction, has been explained largely through a hierarchical assembly process. And the basic idea is you start with this long chain of double-stranded DNA. The first level of compaction is that the DNA gets wrapped twice around an octomer of histone proteins, forming nucleosome structures. And those nucleosomes have then been proposed to assemble into what's been called the 30 nanometer fiber. It's a two-start helix of, of self-satisfied nucleosomes. Those fibers then assemble into thicker fibers, which assemble into still thicker fibers, and eventually you get something like the mitotic chromosome, um, which is the most, most compact unit of chromatin. Um, and there are, there are some older data that support this, but as imaging has gotten better and better and better, and people have been able to look inside intact nuclei of eukaryotic cells, um, clearly one sees tons and tons of nucleosomes, but these higher order structures 
uh, if they're there, are not highly enriched. Um, and so the question of how you go, how the cell goes from nucleosomes to mitotic chromosomes um, still is, I, I would argue, quite, quite poorly understood. Now, <clears throat> there have been a, a variety of recent studies that have invoked liquid-liquid phase separation as, as a mode of organizing chromatin. Um, the earliest ones came from Gary Carpin and Gita Narlikar, um, where they showed that the uh, critical heterochromatin protein HP1-alpha was able to undergo liquid-liquid phase separation and recruit in uh, DNA. And they proposed, uh, on that basis and a variety of other data, that this phase separation of HP1-alpha is an important organizer of chromatin. Um, there's been a lot of work um, done on various models of, of assembling transcriptional machineries. Um, uh, there are some who have argued for overt liquid-liquid phase separation, particularly uh, Phil Sharp and Rick Young. Um, uh, uh, Robert Tijan um, and Xavier Darjak have a, a somewhat different model, but that nevertheless invokes assembly of molecules at sites of active uh, transcription. All of these models, though, essentially invoke proteins as the drivers. It's the assembly of the protein that creates the thing, and then DNA kind of follows. There have also been a, a variety of computational models of chromatin organization um, <clears throat> that, that invoke differential interactions between different types of chromatin. Um, they'll, they'll invoke euchromatin interacting better with euchromatin than, with, than between you and heterochromatin, and heterochromatin interacting better with itself than with other types. Um, and in that way, they've been able to uh, generate simulations of overall organization of chromatin in the eukaryotic nucleus. And in some cases, they've been able to show that those match quite well actual microscopy data um, of different, different types of chromatin. Um, an issue with, with, with these models is that they generally lack any kind of molecular mechanism. They say, you know, heterochromatin likes heterochromatin, euchromatin likes euchromatin, but, but they don't in, involve any specific kinds of context that would, that would produce those interactions. Now, we got interested in this area, I got interested in this area, um, through this lens of multivalency-driven phase separation in the following way. Um, uh, the, um, chromatin can be thought of as, as essentially a large, long, multivalent polymer with the nucleosome as the basic unit. Now, the DNA wrapping around the histone core is obviously very positively charged. The histones uh, all have these long tails that emerge from the faces of the nucleosome that are all quite basic. And so one can think of perhaps acidic basic interactions um, uh, driving assembly of these systems. Moreover, of course, we know there are many different kinds of post-translational modification, epigenetic marks, that are put onto those histone tails. And many of the proteins that read out those marks have multiple reader domains. And so another way of multivalency-driven interactions that could produce assembly of, of chromatin. And so even though the scale is very different from modular domain proteins, coming back to the theme I established a couple of slides ago, you know, nucleosomes are gigantic compared to a protein domain. And moreover, even though the DNA linkers are much more rigid than protein linkers, and I'll come back to that in just a few minutes, even though there are those differences, fundamentally, the essential multivalency is the same. And so we, we thought long ago that perhaps this would be a system that could undergo phase separation. And in fact, there's been a, a lot of work uh, from a variety of labs that have shown that if one starts with different kinds of arrays of nucleosomes and adds, in this case, superphysiologic magnesium, one can see precipitation of the chromatin. And there's been a little work, uh, as far as we can tell, doing sort of light microscopy imaging of those precipitates and what one sees, for example, this, this paper um, uh, from the Meishima lab, um, you know, sort of these aggregated uh, structures, which might be consistent with some kind of, certainly, assembly process. And so <clears throat> with that as sort of framing of our thinking, um, a new postdoc in my lab, a terrific guy named Brian Gibson, um, who came to my lab from Lee Krause's lab, and thus a background in, in genome organization, 
Um, Brian was able to put together a dodecameric or a series of dodecameric arrays of nucleosomes based on the positioning sequence, the Widom 601 sequence, and label um, uh, H2B with a fluorophore. And sure enough, one takes solutions of those molecules and puts them in either physiologic monovalent salt or in this case a little bit superphysiologic uh, divalent salt. One seems formation of these think quite beautiful um, uh, spherical uh, objects that have both histones in them as well as we can use a, a, a stain for double-stranded DNA, also have um, DNA in them. And I should note that, that Gita Narlikar, um, uh, UCSF, independently made similar observations. Um, since our initial work here, a, a variety of groups have made uh, also similar observations. Now, the behavior of this system followed many features that we would uh, expect for multivalency-driven phase separation. So for example, if we look at the, the presence of phase separation, that's what the black dots are here, or the absence, which are the, the unmarked um, intersections, one can see that over relatively small changes in salt, either monovalent or divalent, um, we go from no droplets to droplets, or no, no structures to structures at this point. Um, we can see the same thing as we add, um, increase the concentration of the nucleosomes themselves, relatively sharp transitions to forming these things. Moreover, we see a quite strong dependence on the valence of the array. So a, a, a tetrameric nucleosome array um, doesn't ever, in the conditions we've been able to find, form large macroscopic um, droplets. A hexanucleosome array, though, does, but you've got to go to a bit higher salt concentration and the, the dodecameric array phase separates a whole lot better than those others. So again, some exactly what we would expect from multivalency driven phase separation. Um, an interesting thing that we were pleased about is that when we look at the concentration within the, the droplets here, um, A, it's, it's the degree of concentration is enormous. It's about 10,000 fold in the droplets versus the surroundings. Um, we just thought that was cool. It was the record we had seen in our lab. Um, more substantively, though, the concentration of nucleosomes within the droplets is at least, uh, you know, within the range of nucleosome concentrations that have been measured in eukaryotic nuclei, um, you know, which, of course, doesn't mean this is what's going on in nuclei, but, you know, we, if, well, at least we're not two orders of magnitude off, right? So this kind of, of compaction or this kind of a process could uh, at least contribute to what's going on in cells. These are uh, very clearly liquid-like structures. Um, if we photobleach the center of a large one, we can watch the recovery on, uh, quantified on time scales here of, of about 10 minutes. Um, that's slower than, than other phase separated systems, which suggests that the, these are more viscous um, droplets than, than observed elsewhere. But clearly this is, this is liquid. Um, there's been a bit of controversy in the literature there with other groups, one other group in particular seeing different things. Um, we're quite confident that if you handle the droplets correctly and you don't um, uh, photo cross-link them, um, that this is really quite general. We've been able to do this in a wide range of buffers and we basically always see this, this same kind of behavior. So we think this really is intrinsic to, to these um, systems. We can um, uh, also assess the, the, the dynamic properties, the liquid-like properties here by making two solutions of droplets, one labeled red, one labeled green. And if we mix them together, you can see what happens. We can see very rapid fusion of the different colors. And this is about a 25-minute movie. And what I hope you can see is that the fusion itself occurs very rapidly. As soon as droplets hit each other, they, they um, uh, round up and become spherical. What's interesting, though, is that the pole of the incoming color remains for quite some time. You can see the green pole remains for, for quite a bit of time here. I think I may have lost my laser pointer. OK, I will do my best just to point things out. <laughs> So we can see this um, a, a little bit better if we look um, uh, at snapshots from individual um, uh, points in the movie. So if you look at, at this one over here, what you can see is at 30 seconds, the two droplets have encountered each other. By the time a minute's gone by, boom, they've, they've rounded up. 
right? So there's very strong surface tension in these systems. But the polar cap of green exists all the way out to, let's say, 15, 20 minutes or so. So consistent with the idea that the viscosity within these structures is very high, but nevertheless, the surface tension is, is very high that can overcome that and, and cause rapid uh, rounding. So high surface tension, also high viscosity. We've looked a little bit at the, the chemical determinants of this phase separation process. And what we see is if we chop off the, the tails, the image on the left here with, with um, uh, proteases, that essentially the, the nucleosomes we know remain intact in this experiment. I'm not showing it, but they're intact. Um, but we completely lose the ability for these things to assemble and phase separate. Moreover, um, there's what's, what's been called the basic patch on the histone H4 tail that plays an important role in organizing chromatin in cells. If we mutate that patch on H4 in our optimers, again, we lose the capacity to phase separate. Um, and, that, and that's consistent with, with previous data on the precipitation of chromatin arrays um, by magnesium. Um, <clears throat> this is not an identical dependency, though, in those other experiments because when people look, have looked at precipitation, there's also an acidic patch on the face of the nucleosome that plays an important role there. And at least in our hands, if we mutate it here, um, the, the droplets can still form. We haven't quantified whether the phase separation boundary has shifted, so there may be quantitative difference, but not qualitative differences. So just to summarize this uh, part of my talk, what I've shown you so far um, is that um, polynucleosome arrays will undergo liquid-liquid phase separation when moved into physiologic salt concentrations on the order of, of 100 millimolar monovalent salts and zero to a couple millimolar of, of divalent salts, calcium or magnesium. Um, the phase separation depends on the length of the nucleosome arrays. And the, the phase separation condenses the chromatin to concentrations within a physiologic um, range. I showed you the droplets are, are dynamic, but, but nevertheless very highly uh, viscous. And finally, that the interactions of the histone tails are, are clearly important for this process. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't know how at this point. We're hoping, I'll show you a little bit of, of cryo-EM data, we're hoping to begin to understand it through direct structural studies. Now, one of the questions that we asked as we were going through this is, is there any place in cell biology where these kinds of behaviors of chromatin have, have been observed experimentally? And the answer is that we're aware of at least three situations um, where it does seem to occur. So one of them is during apoptosis, um, because there's a, a, a large body of data showing that one of the early things that happens in apoptosis is DNA condenses in the nucleus. Um, and that's shown in, in the images on the upper left there. Um, in addition, during keratinocyte development, um, or more generally, during processes of enucleation. Ah, thank you. During, during processes, whoops, ah, okay, I'll use it as a pointer. Um, you see the little arrow there. Um, in processes of enucleation, so where the nucleus is kicked out of the eukaryotic cell, it's one of the things that happens in the later stages of keratinocyte development, also during red blood cell development, for example, that also occurs. And in all of those processes, what's been reported is that the DNA condenses in the nucleus. And here's a, an image from a paper from Elaine Fuchs's lab. She actually, in this paper, was focused on the phase separation of the molecule here shown in green. Um, but kind of a side note is you can, you can see clearly that the chromatin is, has condensed here. Um, the other place uh, that one has observed, uh, has been observed for, for many, many years, decades now, um, is in the macronucleus of tetrahymena. Um, where the heterochromatin has been, is organized into these uh, roughly spherical structures that have been called chromatin bodies. Um, and the surrounding lighter regions in this um, EM micrograph um, is the euchromatin in these organisms. Now, the question is, is there anything that unites these three biological processes? And one thing that jumped out to us is they all occur when DNA is, is fragmented, is in small pieces. So 
in fact, during apoptosis, the, the event that, that is believed to cause this condensation is nuclease activity that chops the chromatin up into small pieces. And in fact, this same paper studying apoptosis showed if you isolate nuclei of cells and you treat them with a variety of nucleases, you can see the chromatin condensing. It doesn't have to be during apoptosis. Um, DNA is fragmented during enucleation. And you know, the, the reason that, that telomerase was, was discovered or was looked for um, uh, in tetrahymena is because tetrahymena naturally stores its genome in relatively small pieces of DNA. So there's lots of, lots of ends, lots of telomeres. Um, and so we think that, that, that what this is telling us is that in, in all of these cases, the long range constraints on the chromatin polymer um, uh, cross-linking with, with molecules like cohesins and condensins, um, other kinds of interactions that produce long-range interactions, those get lost when, when the chromatin is chopped up. And so without those constraints, we think that this liquid-like behavior um, really is intrinsic to the chromatin polymer. And so when you remove them experimentally, um, what you see is this inherent condensation. And a corollary of that is we think that the dynamics that we are observing in the droplets and the chemical interactions that we will ultimately discover that or figure out that, that cause these reflect short range dynamics in chromatin. Because there's a, a variety of experimental data, uh, you know, everything from FRAP studies to single molecule imaging, single nucleosome imaging, um, that show that DNA, that chromatin is quite dynamic on short length scales less than, let's say, 100 nanometers. But then, if you look on longer length scales, is, is uh, absolutely not dynamic. And so, again, what we think is that what we're seeing in our, the movement in our droplets likely reflects those short-range interactions, those short-range motions of, of bona fide chromatin, um, because we have, again, relieved those long-range constraints that produce uh, the lack of motion on longer length scales. So we're more than happy to talk about, about those ideas afterwards. So in, along these lines of where in biology might all of this matter, we've had a really wonderful collaboration um, with Daniel Gerlich at the IMP in Vienna, and in particular with his, his really terrific graduate student, Max Schneider. Um, because uh, Daniel has been interested in, uh, for a number of years, in an interesting question. It is how is it that chromosomes are pushed by microtubules away from the spindle poles during mitosis? So, if you're like me and you don't know a heck of a lot about, about chromatin, um, one thinks of what happens during mitosis is the chromatin has to be pulled into the two daughter cells. Well, that's what happens late in mitosis. Early in mitosis, though, the chromatin's got to be aligned at, at the metaphase plate, so it's got to be pushed from around the nucleus to, to line up in the center of the cell. And so that's the question that Daniel was, was trying to answer. And a specific way of phrasing this is, and, and the pushing is known to occur by microtubules. So you go from this chromatin throughout the nucleus on the left in interphase during mitosis to being pushed again into the metaphase plate. Happens by microtubules. So the question is, how is it that chromosomes can be moved by the microtubules? Why don't the microtubules just penetrate throughout the chromatin matrix, um, which would then render it unable to be moved around? And so, to get at this, um, Max did a, a really interesting experiment. And I think the truth of the matter is, I think Max did this experiment first and then tried to figure out what it all meant in terms of microtubules moving around. Um, but Max took um, a mitotic cell and microinjected into it um, a nuclease. And here's what he found. So you do the microinjection and within minutes, the chromatin basically rounds up and forms these spherical, oh shoot, I hate when it does that, forms these beautiful spherical structures. You can, you can watch them, I'll play it again, you can watch them move around. You can watch them clearly fuse with each other. Um, you can watch them move out, and, uh, spread out and separate as, as little liquid droplets. Um, really looks, uh, for, all, for all intents and purposes, like formation of a chromatin liquid in the cells. Um, and moreover, if you photobleach one of these droplets, you can see the movie here and the, 
the data below it, um, you bleach and the recover, recovery occurs very fast. And you can see in quantification here, on roughly 10 seconds, basically, you fill in the bleach spot. So I think it's very clear that once you chop up the chromatin, um, at least in mitotic cells, um, you create a liquid-like structure. Now, <clears throat> the density of, of the chromatin in intact, or the density of intact chromatin and the density of these droplets generated by nucleases turns out to be identical within experimental error. And this is, this is quantification from a, a number of cells. And so what that says is that the, pro the physical properties, the interactions that contribute to this phase separation are very likely the same processes that contribute to compaction of a real bona fide native uh, chromatin. And I should note um, for those in the office and in the audience who think about condensin, condensin depletion, um, which does play important roles here, has no effect on, on density. And so this, is, this doesn't seem to be something that has to do with condensin-mediated long-range crosslinks. Again, we think that this is largely due to these short-range interactions intrinsic to the chromatin polymer. Now, not only does the, the fragmented chromatin have the same density um, as, as native uh, chromatin, um, it can also be pushed around by microtubules in analogous ways. So, again, here on the left is what native chromatin looks like as the cell goes into mitosis. It gets pushed around, pushed around, and ends up aligned here on the metaphase plate. Um, in the cell on the right, um, the microtubule network has been disassembled with nicotazole, um, <coughs> digested with nuclease, and then the nicotazole was washed out. And what you're looking at is, is microtubules in green, and you can see that as the microtubule networks reform, those, that liquid-like chromatin gets pushed around out to the cell periphery in ways that, that uh, seem analogous to the way, again, native chromatin uh, gets pushed around um, uh, when, when it's intact. And so uh, our, our conclusion from this is that the material properties of chromatin seem in this particular context, in the pushing context, to really be governed by this liquid-liquid phase separation process. So the question is sort of how. And on this we're a little bit less clear, but it seems to have to do with the fact that for chemical reasons, microtubules and tubulin are both excluded from both chromatin in cells and also from phase-separated chromatin droplets. And so here are our uh, cryo-electron tomograms, uh, slices from a tomogram of, of a, uh, a real cell. The chromatin is here uh, outlined in, in darker colors. And I hope people can see that there are a variety of microtubules here. And what one sees if one looks at, at a blown up region here is that the microtubules most of the time here extend to the surface of the chromatin but don't penetrate into it. And in this, this larger view that more closely matches the image here, again, you can see when they've outlined a lot of microtubules, um, again, they, they really don't penetrate very much at all into the, the mass of the chromatin. In vitro, one can do experiments where you can label uh, tubulin um, uh, with a color, and what you see is that tubulin gets excluded from the droplets formed by nucleosomerase. And if one does this um, in a way that allows the microtubules to form, they basically form a matter that is, that is excluded from the droplets. Now, for technical reasons, we weren't able to do an experiment where we could create an array of microtubules that would push on the droplets. We were hoping to be able to do that. And just again, for technical reasons, it never worked out. But at least looking at these, these uh, non-dynamic systems, um, it seems pretty clear that both tubulin and microtubules don't get into our droplets, um, paralleling what one sees uh, in vivo in, in cells. And I, I should note that in both cases, both in vivo or in cells um, and in vitro, this exclusion appears to be based on the high negative charge um, on tubulin, which kind of makes intuitive sense. You've got very negatively charged DNA, and negative charged molecules don't like to go into those droplets. And so um, <clears throat> essentially what we think is that the material properties of the phase-separated chromatin um, enable it to be pushed 
by, by microtubules. So this is, this is then led to a model um, where chromatin is condensed both by intrinsic liquid-liquid phase separation interactions between nucleosomes um, on short length scales and again on long length scales um, uh, condensin will, will hold longer loops together but that the resistance to microtubule forces depends mostly um, on, on uh, again, the phase separation properties, the, the, the short range interactions between nucleosomes within, within chromatin. So, um, in my, my last couple of vignettes here, I want to tell you a bit more about the work that we've done in vitro on these systems, um, and in particular, to look at how different regulatory factors that have been known to, to modulate chromatin in cells interact with our nucleosome arrays. And so there are two things I'll tell you about this afternoon. One of them is, that this, is the spacing between nucleosomes, um, and the other one is the actions of histone tail acetylation and histone tail readers. So there's an interesting observation that's been in the literature since the, the late 1970s. And that is if one looks on a genome-wide scale at the positions of nucleosomes and the length of the linkers between nucleosomes, um, one sees in uh, essentially all eukaryotes that this has been looked at so far, everything from, from yeast out to, to mice and to, to humans as well, one sees this interesting oscillatory pattern. If you look at the frequency of a given linker length, um, both in yeast, you see it, you also see it in mice. And if you look at the, the periodicity here, basically what you see is that for uh, 10 n spacing, where n is an integer, so 10 nucleotides, or 10 base pairs, 20 base pairs, 30 base pairs, those are all depleted on a genome-wide scale. 10 n plus 5, so 15, 25, 35 base pairs, those are all the ones that are enriched on a genome-wide scale. And again, this is seen across the eukaryotic spectrum, and the reasons for it really remain um, uh, entirely unknown. Now, what, if you think about this, um, DNA has 10.2 uh, base pairs per turn, um, which means that 10N essentially aligns successive nucleosomes facing the same way. Right, so 20 base pairs, 30 base pairs, nucleosomes at either end of this will aim the same way. 10N plus 5 aims them exactly opposite. So 15, 25, 35 aims them in, in opposite directions. Now, the structural biology that's done, um, crystallography and cryo-EM, has been done on the 10N spacing arrays. And what one sees there are these beautiful 30 nanometer fibers, where every other nucleosome stacks on itself. So one, two, three, four, five. So even ones stack on themselves, odd ones stack on themselves. So the 30 nanometer fiber is made with 10 N spacing, but that's the one that's disfavored in cells. So the question is what, what is different about 10 N plus five spacing? And you might have guessed what the answer is. Turns out that 10 N plus five linkers produce beautiful phase-separated droplets. And we've looked at 15, 25, 35, actually out to 45, they all phase-separate. 10N spacing phase-separates much more poorly. So 20 base pairs will a little bit, 30 we don't see anything, 40 we don't see anything. Um, this is with monovalent salts. If we add a little bit of divalent salts, one millimolar divalent salts, we can then begin to see phase separation of 30 and 40, but it's still much, much less than we see with the 10 N plus 5 series. Um, and so what this suggests to us, you know, this is the spacing that is enriched in cells. Um, perhaps, again, this supports the idea that, that phase separation, interactions between chains of chromatin may be used to, to organize cells, and in vitro with our short fragments, it manifests um, as phase separation. And of course, this says that chromatin remodelers that push around nucleosomes and dictate their relative spacing may be something that can be used to control not just nucleosomes along one strand, but the association between different strands of chromatin giving higher order organization. Now, one thing 
again, I'm a structural biologist at heart. That's where my training is. Um, that's one of the things that I love to do. And so we've become very interested in understanding the internal organization of phase separated droplets at large. Um, Chromatin droplets are particularly amenable to this because in cryo-electron tomograms, cryo-ET images, um, an individual nucleosome is big enough to be able to be seen. Whereas most of the other kind of droplets that I'm aware of, the individual particles are too small and so you just get kind of a dense gray image. Here you can see, and this is, this is um, uh, one slice of a tomogram that we've taken um, of a droplet that, that's sort of irregular in shape because in part it's stuck to something on the matrix um, and in part because we we use standard blotting techniques which distort these. Um, but nevertheless, you can see that, that within this structure there are a whole lot of individual nucleosomes. So what I'm going to do is run through individual stacks of this in a movie. And you'll see, again, we can see lots and lots of different nucleosomes. Um, you can see that many of them, if you, if you try to look carefully, they're in kind of random orientations. But there's also some regular structures within them. And I'll highlight some of those at the end. We get these very interesting filament-like structures that are about 10 nanometers in diameter, which is just about the diameter of an individual nucleosome. And they look kind of like stacks of coins. Um, and the truth is we're not sure what to make of these. We're still doing a lot of work to, to analyze these images and figure out what those structures are. Um, what's interesting is that uh, Claude O'Shea, who's a, a wonderful chemical biologist at the Salk Institute, has developed ways, she calls it chrome EMT, of looking at nucleosomes in intact nuclei. And while she doesn't see a lot of 30 nanometer fibers, she sees these weird things that look like stacks of coins that are about 10 nanometers thick. And so we think that perhaps this kind of structure does in fact represent something that's going on um, in eukaryotic cells. So um, stay tuned. We've got a, a lot of work going on, on on all the different kinds of droplets we're making. And hopefully we'll understand them over the next few years with, with cryo-ET. So the last thing I want to uh, tell you about this afternoon is our work to understand um, post-translational modifications and particularly acetylation of chromatin and its role in this, in this whole process. So um, it's widely known that acetylation of histone tails um, opens chromatin uh, in vivo. It decreases the density of chromatin in cells and also enables processes like transcription and DNA repair. And so uh, my postdoc, Brian, uh, rigged up a, 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 I would say, largely artificial system where we can recruit um, uh, the, the catalytic domain of the P300 histone acetyltransferase into our chromatin droplets um, <clears throat> um, through, through binding of a, a fusion protein to the TET-R um, uh, transcription factor to a TET-O sequence um, in the DNA. And so we can, uh, if we label this um, histone acetyltransferase with GFP, we can see that initially it gets into the droplets quite well. So here is an image of droplets um, looking at the histone. Here is the, those same droplets now looking at GFP. And you can see we get very high concentrations of this, of this um, enzyme into our droplets. And if we add acetyl-CoA, which is a cofactor for acetylation, you can see as the acetylation proceeds, the droplets become a little dimmer, 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 and then eventually they crumple up and go away. Um, and so what this suggests to us is that, that chromatin could be controlled, um, phase-separated chromatin could be controlled through acetylation of the histone tails, which evidently weaken nucleosome-nucleosome interactions. We don't know how yet. Um, other than obviously they quench the charge, um, and that that ultimately leads, causes lower density and ultimately leads to complete dissolution of the system here. So the last thing we wanted to look at um, was what about these histone tail readers? So there is a uh, widely used domain called the bromo domain that binds selectively to acetylated histone tails um, on chromatin. And we created an entirely engineered protein, a pentabromo protein. We took a single bromo domain and strung it together in an array. We also looked at a natural uh, chromatin regulatory protein uh, called BRD4 
which contains two bromo domains as well as an uh, IDR region and C terminus that can self assemble. And in both cases, we did the following experiment. We started off with chromatin droplets. We acetylated them to a high degree with the P300 uh, acetyltransferase, and again, the droplets went away. And in both cases, then, if we added the bromo domain protein to it, we reintroduced a new phase um, that contains both the, the bromo protein as well as chromatin. We can see that for the pentabromo as well as for BRD4. Now, in both cases, we know that the interaction or formation of this new phase requires multivalency. Um, a single bromo domain protein uh, absolutely does not at any concentration um, cause reformation of the, of the uh, separated phase. And if we block binding to the, the acetylated lysine tail, either through a mutation or through a small molecule called JQ1, again, in both cases, we block formation of this acetyl bromo phase. Now, the last piece of data I want to show you um, is what we call our chromatin caterpillar. Um, uh, we did an experiment that I really honestly did not think was, was going to yield something this interesting. But we, we asked, what if we start with both acetylated chromatin and unacetylated chromatin? So this is a single, single tube that has both in it. The unacetylated chromatin assembles into droplets. Um, the acetylated chromatin does not. It's uniformly distributed. And if we add the pentabromo domain protein to it, we can see that, again, we reintroduce that acetylated bromo phase. Um, but what's cool is it does not coalesce with the unacetylated chromatin. So if we show both colors here together, we can see that we get these two distinct phases. They adhere to each other, so there's enough attraction to cause adhesion, but not so much adhesion that the molecules coalesce and form a single dense phase. And so what that tells us, at least in physical terms, is that phase separation can produce distinct chromatin domains that obviously have distinct physical properties and by implication could have distinct functions. So again, I want to be very clear what, what we know and what we don't know. What we know is that in vitro, there, there are distinct physical properties of these kinds of chromatin. Um, we don't know, of course, that this process contributes in a meaningful way to chromatin inside cells, but it certainly says that the physical properties alone are sufficient to give distinct domains. And so it gives us things that we are, we are currently pursuing. Again, my postdoc, Brian, is currently pursuing in my lab, and also he's moving to St. Jude to start his own lab uh, this summer um, to try to understand whether this, this physical incompatibility between these different kind of phases really could contribute to the distinctions between, say, euchromatin and heterochromatin uh, in cells. So I'll just finish up by, by summarizing what I've told you is that that liquid-liquid um, phase separation is an intrinsic property of uh, chromatin fragments, of polynucleosome arrays. And that this can give um, uh, mechanisms of very, very strong compaction, but allow the chromatin to remain dynamic in that state. Um, there are a number of different regulatory factors that, that will um, uh, modulate this process. I told you uh, a little bit about our work to understand different linker lengths and acetylation of bromo domains. We've also looked at histone H H1, again, a very important uh, chromatin regulator. I'd be happy to answer questions about that. Um, and so, um, you know, the chromatin regulators can act on this liquid phase, and one of the things they can do is produce uh, distinct domains. And so what we think is that this intrinsic property of chromatin could then is sort of a, a, a basis set of interactions that biology will then act on through all of these different regulatory factors to give the, the various chromatin structures and chromatin functions um, in cells. So I'll thank the people involved in this work. Um, all the previous work in the lab, uh, again, was done by four graduate students who've all left the lab at this point. Um, the story today on chromatin um, was really driven by uh, Brian Gibson. It's just absolutely fabulous, insightful postdoc in my lab 
um, Brian is here uh, in the back right of this image. Um, also working with our, our lab manager, uh, Linda Doolittle, um, who really was essential. There are so many reagents to put together for all of this, and, and um, Linda was just spectacular in providing um, all of the resources needed to do these experiments. Um, and again, I mentioned uh, our ongoing collaboration with Daniel Gerlich and Max Schneider. Um, also, Cy Redding was involved um, in some of the early stages of, of this whole story. And so well, I think a lot of the, the biological implications that we have at this point uh, really owe significantly to, to Daniel and Max. So it's been great to work with them. So uh, again, I'll just conclude by uh, reiterating, it's just been a great couple of days for me here. Um, I've really enjoyed meeting so many people. Interactions have been wonderful. Dinner last night was great. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. And again, thanks for listening to me for another hour. That was a wonderful talk. The experiments where you injected the nuclease were, were, were was were, really were cool. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and it, it made me wonder, um, first, do you know how many sites for Al ALU-1 there are in the genome and how many pieces yeah. you're cutting it into? Because I'm just wondering if you can inject different nucleases and say, oh, you get this behavior if there are are 10,000 sites, but not 1,000 sites yeah. or so, something. So interesting, you know, so I, I'm pretty sure ALA-1 is a four-base cutter. If oh, so okay. it's a lot. Thank you. So, so it's a lot. Yeah. Right? Um, the problem is that you're doing this individual cells, so it's not like you can run a gel and see what the distribution of fragments is. Um, we had talked about, but I honestly don't remember the reasoning, but, but Max didn't go look at, you know, six nucleotide cutters or rare cutters to see to see if there were differences. I, I think the argument was just that it's so hard to know what you've got anyway. It yeah. might be hard to interpret that. Yeah. Then what happens to the cells after this happens? You showed them they begin to push the, the DNA to the edges, but then yeah. what next? Do they just undergo apoptosis or do they yeah, stick they, around for a while? They, or they, they I, I don't know the mechanism by which they croak, but yeah, they, they basically die. Okay. See, see, they don't live a whole lot longer after, okay. <laughs> after you've done that to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I should say one, one interesting point along the lines of what you're asking about the, the size dependence. One of the things that Brian, Brian has done recently that, again, he's taking away into his own lab is he's been able to uh, isolate nuclei from, you know, we buy gazillion gallons of HeLa cells, isolate nuclei from them, um, chop them up with nucleases, and then isolate, figure out a, a beautiful way of getting most of the chromatin out of the cells. We can isolate, he can isolate it in quite pure form in a biochemical prep. And what we've seen that A, you can add salt to that and it, and it phase separates, but that <clears throat> fragments on order of, I think it's the 4,000 to 5,000 cut Phase separate at lower salt than if you if you take things that are in sort of the 2,000 3,000 cut. All right, so even with native chromatin, the notion of longer um, arrays begetting phase separation um, is better. It's not quite the experiment you would like to see, but it's along the lines of you know size dependence, even with natural chromatin. Perhaps you mentioned it, but if you put it into an interphase cell, do you also get, uh, I mean, obviously there's a difference in just condensed states of chromosomes, but what happens for an interphase cell? Do you get the blobs? Good, good question. So, so you get small little bits, small, small condensed droplets, and we don't know what those are, but not nearly to the, to the same extent. And we think probably it's because there's, one of the things that happens as cells go into mitosis, and they know better than I, is they become deacetylated to a very large degree. And there's a lot more acetylation going on in, in interface. They didn't do an experiment where they did that injection also with, um, you know, an acetyltransferase inhibitor. Right. So we kind of assume that, that, that the reason we don't see the same kind of massive condensation is because there's a lot more acetylation. Sure. And you also have a hyperphosphorylation um, on S10. I was wondering if, if Brian or someone has made the recombinant proteins and done that in vitro. Does S10 promote um, condensation? We, we haven't tried that yet. And then the HAT experiment. So one of the preferred uh, substrates for P300 is K16 on H4. So 
So you could just be like, well, the reason why the hat is acting like the basic patch is because it's hitting the same. But yeah. are there other licenses? There's so many licenses that, that P300 hits. Right. Do you know which ones are actually important for this? No. Um, and you know? Any students who want to come to postdoc and do that <laughs> experiment? So I'll, 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 I'll make it a little bit further than that. We, we, so the answer is no, we don't know which sites get hit. We don't know if it's merely the collection of sites or if it is you know, K-16 that's critical. Moreover, in the reforming the structures, we don't know whether there are certain sites that, that the Bromo domain binds to that are better to, to reform. It doesn't have to be that the sites that, that are used to blow up the chromatin are the same sites that are used to reform it. Those, those could be orthogonal. Okay. So again, there's, you know, there's like a PhD thesis or a postdoc to do with that, and we just haven't done it yet. The pandemic has, that's one of the things the pandemic has slowed, yeah. Very interesting results. So what does addition of H1 do? Well, I'll, I'll just tell you, because I had a couple of slides that I took out for time. Um, so H1 does two things. First of all, it compacts the droplets. So the, the fluorescence intensity goes up by about 25%, consistent with what H1 does in cells. Um, it also basically solidifies the droplets. So if we, add, if we add H1 to existing droplets or we form droplets in the presence of H1, um, we see the same kind of round structures form, but they're, but they're absolutely solid. So they won't fuse, in other words. They don't, we'll see them contact to each other and they stick to each other, but, ah. they, don't, but they don't do that. Again, to, consistent with what's been observed for, for H1 in cells, controlling the dynamics. So this may be more relevant to yesterday's talk, but mm. what is it that limits the size of the of the droplets? Ah. Quite, because you show they fuse, but do they dissociate as well? Yeah, good good question. So in vitro, really nothing limits the size of the droplets. They they basically as long as eventually after a day or two, for reasons we don't understand, most droplet systems stop fusing. But in in general, they will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, be, because the, the thermodynamic state is to minimize overall surface tension, and that would be one, one enormous droplet. In cells, the sizes do seem to be, to be limited, and there's some really wonderful, actually, somebody I, apparently you are trying, all trying to recruit here <laughs> um, to, to uh, uh, Wisconsin. Um, a woman in Geraldine Saidu's lab showed that there's, there's a molecule that interacts with the surface of one kind of droplet here, that basically forms a, what's called a Pickering emulsion, which sort of stabilizes a particular size. And so my guess is that there are a lot of different condensates in cells that have that analogous kind of emulsifier. But in vitro, if you just have the, the, the few purified proteins you were talking about yesterday, they just get bigger and bigger. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. A new way of giving seminars. Debayan asks, thanks for the great talk. Is charge the only criterion for the LLPS? Is LLPS only restricted charged biological polymers such as DNA, RNA? So uh, absolutely not. Um, you know, molecules can come together through many, many different types of interactions. Obviously, some of it's charge-based, some of it's hydrophob hydrophobicity-based. Um, there are specific interactions that tend to be higher affinity, long-lived. There are um, interactions with lower specificity that tend to have um, uh, lower affinities and be more short-lived. All of those kinds of interactions can come together. I think the, the key feature is simply multivalency. There have to be multiple adhesive elements to allow formation of larger structures, which ultimately drives uh, the insolubility. But, but all kinds of different interactions play in here. I, th there's an experiment that people do in the literature that I really hate, which is you add hexane, one, one six hexane diol to droplets and they go away. All you're doing is disrupting hydrophobic interactions across the whole cell. So it has nothing to do with phase separation per se. And it relates to this many different ways to put these together. Yeah. 
So relative to that, what is the temperature sensitivity of the ah, phase yeah. separation? So, so most, but not all biological systems show what's called an upper critical temperature. And that is that as you increase the temperature, the concentration of the bulk phase um, goes up and the concentration of the droplets comes down. And then eventually you go past a, a critical point, a critical temperature, and above that it becomes a single phase again. Um, there are some that go in the opposite direction and it relates to, to the role of, of water people think, such that it, at, as you go up in temperature, you favor phase separation. For, but for most biopolymers, as you go up, the droplets tend to go away. And so we, we've seen that in a number of our, our systems here. Yep. So have you tried to ask if different transcription factors can interface with these droplets in different ways? For example, pioneer transcription factors? Yeah, we, 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 we did one, again, this is one of the things that sort of got clocked by the, um, the pandemic. We, we've looked at one transcription factor. Um, what, one of the things we're interested in is if we, Um, if we add magnesium, as I said, we can coax both the 30 base pair and the 35 base pair to make droplets, right? They're, they're easier for 35. We think that those droplets have different internal structures. The 30 base pair is probably making 30 nanometer fibers that assemble laterally. The 35 is probably making our 10 nanometer things. And we asked whether if we rig in a transcription factor binding site into those two, does it, does it care? And with an N of one, no, it didn't, which was kind of disappointing. I was really hoping. Um, one that a new postdoc in the lab had worked on as a graduate student. Um, ETV4? So, yeah, no, sorry. I'm, I, 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 I honestly, um, one of, it was one of the Etz family transcription factors, right, that, that, that has like a nanomolar binding affinity for, for a specific site. And we could put that specific site into either, um, again, the 35 or the 30, and its partition coefficient was basically the same in two cases. But my, my gut feeling, though, is that there's going to be differences, right? And that biology, because these likely will have different internal structures, and biology cares about structure. And so we should see functional differences there. Okay, we'll get to that. So I was just thinking about the fact that enhancers and promoters can both have a settle marks and that they often sort of come together even if not stably. So, and to me with your data at the end where you showed that the um, unacetylated sort of forms a phase separate from the acetylated, whether yeah. you guys had thought or whether you had experiments planned that could help to test whether those sort of interactions were helping with that sort of transient enhancer promoter interactions. Uh, yeah, I mean, we. We've, we've thought about that, but we don't, we don't have any, anything planned. Um, Cliff Brangwin, though, another person who works in this field, done really wonderful work. Um, Cliff has shown that he, he has a way of using light to stimulate, makes these opto droplets. And he's shown that in, if the chromatin is, is relatively soft, um, that he can make droplets that will bring together, when the droplets use, they will bring together distant regions of, of DNA. And so the implication being that, that perhaps that's involved in sort of enhancer, long range enhancer promoter interactions. I would think more that, okay, yeah. Apart from the intervening lens. Ah, I see. Yeah, and, and it would sort of like attracts like. Yep, could, yeah. could be. Could be. Could be. I'll piggyback back off that and ask a transcription question as well. Um, so you have to move the histones off of the DNA in order to move a polymerase through, right? Um, but it seems like you would need to maintain some level of histones there to keep it in these droplets and, and have that multivalency. Yeah. Is that contribute to the on-off rates of these histones? Ah, I see. D does the higher order assembly change the ability of, of 
a remodeler to, to move histones around? Interesting question. We, we, we don't know. We don't know. We, we haven't looked at it. If, if I had to guess, I would guess yes. Because, you know, with a, a remodeler just on a single piece of chromatin is only, only fighting against that nucleosome. Whereas if the nucleosomes you can see in our droplets are making many other contacts, it would have to fight against those as well. All right, so yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. Well, if there's no more questions, I think, well, let's thank uh, Dr. Rosen for a fantastic series of seminars. Thank you.